In this series of lessons on self-defense, we find that there are some who claim that Christians may not use force to prevent harm to themselves or to others, and they argue that the statements made in the Old Testament about self-defense applies, does not apply to Christians today, and that teachings of Jesus support pacifism, and it trumps anything that is said in the Old Testament. And plus, it is argued that Jesus never supported self-defense, and he never used self-defense himself. Well, we take the challenge to answer these objections. We want to show you that Jesus does support self-defense, that meets the law's requirements of self-defense as well as that of the Bible. So this topic today is, does Jesus support self-defense? And a verse that we have been using quite often throughout this series is found in Luke 22, 36 through 38, when Jesus um, had his last conversation with the apostles before he went out into the Garden of Gethsemane. And so we find in verses 36 through 38 these words, beginning with verse 35. And he said to them, When I sent you out with no money or a knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, Nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack. And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that the scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, Look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. Now, Jesus obviously knew what was going to happen that evening. And so he wasn't wanting to arm all the twelve apostles, or eleven, pardon me, at that time, because it was late at night, and if they didn't have one, they couldn't go and buy one, because all the stores and marketplaces were, were closed up for the night. And so, in essence, he's saying, in the future mission of carrying out the Great Commission, you need to be uh, aware of the dangers that lurk about, uh, the dangers from the Gentiles, the dangers from robbers, and so forth, and that in order to carry out the Great Commission, you'll be traveling some very dangerous roads in the Roman Empire, and you need to be able to protect yourself. That's what I believe Jesus is saying. Now, already we find Peter carrying one, and I'm guessing, and that's probably, I'm probably 98% sure, the other one was being carried by Simon the Zealot. And he was, uh, the Zealots were known to carry daggers. All right, and so Jesus said, it's enough. Well, it's enough for this evening, because he knew what was going on. And, um, and so basically he nodded his approval for them to carry those swords. But if we ask the question, what would Jesus do, would we conclude that self-defense is not supported by Jesus' manner of handling evil? And some people say, well, all you have to do is ask the question, what would Jesus do? And then you would know that you would not use force to stop an attempt upon your life or the life of your loved ones. But Jesus' mission to allow men to take his life, to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins, is evidence that we are not able to follow the example of Jesus in every instance, in every detail. Jesus would not offer a defense for himself, but Paul, on the other hand, defended himself in court and before the legal magistrates several times. When Jesus was taken before the court, he did not even stand up for himself. He would not answer the charges. Why? Because this was his destiny. Paul, on the other hand, in the last few chapters of the book of Acts, shows numerous times where he's standing before magistrates making a defense for his, his innocence. 
So in essence, Paul is not following the example of Jesus in that regard. So you have to ask, what is he an example uh, for us? In what respects is he an example for us? And certainly in this mission of his, I come to save, uh, seek and save that which is lost and give my life a ransom for many. Um, he evidently would not uh, stop people from taking his life when his hour had come. Jesus was threatened many times before his arrest and execution. Now, he often used miraculous powers to stop the attempt upon his life. Look at uh, Luke 4, 28 through 30. He had just preached in the synagogue at Nazareth and enraged those people because he said that this scripture that he was reading was fulfilled in him basically claiming to be the Son of God. And then in verses 30, uh, 28 through 30, it says, And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things, and they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which the city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. Well, what did Jesus do? Verse 30, But passing through their midst, he went his way. Now let me ask you, how could he have escaped that mob? It says he basically just walked right through the group. And evidently the author is telling us that he used a supernatural power to literally uh, mesmerize those people and, and literally paralyze them until he walked through the mist and went his way. Now, if he could use natural means to protect himself, he did. In John 8, 59, when Jesus said that before Abraham was born, I am, the word I am refers to the name of God and that Moses learned from the Lord in Exodus chapter 3 at the burning bush. Tell the people, I am sent you. And so Jesus used that same expression when he told these people before Abraham was born, I am. Now they got the point because they took up stones to kill him. And it says they picked up stones, verse 59, to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Now in this instance, Jesus avoided being killed by withdrawing and uh hiding from them, and then moving out of the temple when it was safe. He used just a natural means of escaping um, uh, serious harm. But you know, the Lord would not allow himself to be killed until his hour had come. In John 8, 59, and this expression about his hour is very important. Pardon me. In John 7 and verse 30, they were seeking, therefore, to seize him, and no man laid his hand on him because, it says, his hour had not yet come. All right? John is saying that really no attempt on Jesus' life would not be successful because his hour, that is, the day of crucifixion, had not come. In John 8 and verse 20, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. And then, notice the transition in chapter 12 of John, in verse 27. Now my soul has become troubled. Chapter 12 is getting closer to the time of his arrest and execution. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? That hour? He says, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Next in chapter 13 and verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, just before his arrest, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And then his high priestly prayer in John 17, just before he went out into 
um, the, the garden. He says, these things Jesus spoke. And lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son that the son may glorify you. So the point is very clear that Jesus is, uh, Jesus is defending himself in any way that he chooses, whether or not it's miraculous or natural, to hinder any successful attempt to take his life. And what we find in John chapter 10 is it, it cinches this, this up very clearly. Notice 17 and 18. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has, no one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up. Jesus is saying that no matter what man tries to do, that he will fulfill his ministry, and he will offer himself for a sacrifice for sin, and that hour, he will meet that hour no matter how many attempts on his life during his ministry. He says, no one can take it from me because I have power to keep it alive or to lay it down. And so Jesus doesn't serve an example of stopping a murderous attempt uh, uh, by others. Uh, pardon me, Jesus does serve an example of stopping the murderous attempts of others because he did. But we do not possess such miraculous powers. And, but we do have the example of using every method to escape a dangerous situation. But would Jesus allow us to use force to defend ourselves and others? Well, at the arrest of Jesus in Matthew 26 and verse 53, we read, When Peter alone sought to use his sword to prevent the arrest of Jesus, Jesus stopped him and said, Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? Jesus is saying that I wouldn't hesitate to use force to stop this if I wanted to, and if this didn't serve the purpose for which I came. Obviously, the force would be just enough and as much as would be needed in a given situation. And these are a few points about justifiable self-defense that this statement's, uh, statement suggests. The force used was the force that a sensible, rational, and prudent person would feel justified in using to stop an attack in a similar situation. That the force was proportional, not excessive. If you can talk someone out of a violent act or attack, it would it should be done. If you can escape the situation without using lethal force, you are encouraged by the law to do it and by the Lord, by example. If you could but didn't, then the use of force was illegal. Plus, once it is discovered that the danger had, uh, had been stopped before any harm done, then the use of force is not for self-defense. But now the man who made the threats becomes the victim and is guaranteed the same due process of law as you if you were harmed. And so we have to be very careful about the use of self-defense. It has to be legitimate within the justification of the law. And Jesus used force to stop an evil from continuing. Turn with me to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, Jesus drives the money changers out of the temple. In verses 13 through 17, we find that Jesus, uh, on the Passover, went to Jerusalem, and in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove 
all out of the temple along with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Now, all the other uh, gospel accounts record this as well. And these greedy merchants were making a sizable profit off those who would come to worship from foreign countries who would have to ch exchange their, uh, their foreign currency into Jewish currency. And of course, they would charge an exorbitant fee for that service. And, and also, they would have to purchase sacrificial animals because they wouldn't all bring them with them from long distances. And these greedy merchants would set up stalls and cages for sacrificial animals and birds in the temple precincts upon the approval of the high priest. So evidently, the approval of the high priest suggests that he was getting a kickback for allowing them to set up uh, this in the temple precincts. And Jesus saw this by his describing their actions as taking, turning the house of prayer into a den of robbers in Matthew 21, 13, and a house of merchandise in John 2, 16. So we see that Jesus felt a moral obligation to stop this evil from continuing. Also, he, just, he used just enough force to accomplish this. It was not, pardon the pun, overkill. Notice the statement according to Mark's account, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Mark 11 and verse 16. Do you see how Jesus is standing there in a very defensive mode? He drove out the money changers. And can you imagine this one man doing this to the money changers? They felt like they had a right there. Jesus was not arrested. And, and yet we can see that Jesus is acting uh, to protect the holiness of the temple. He used force. Proportional force. Remember that. Now... Now turn with me to Matthew 13, 29. Jesus was accused of uh, casting out demons by the power of Satan, Beelzebub. And Jesus shows the irrationality of this. How, why would Satan uh, empower him to cast out Satan's angels out of people, demons? That's ridiculous. But... Jesus answering the charge that he cast out demons by the power of the devil showed how irrational this would be. And then he gave an illustration that shows Jesus' approval of self-defense and agrees with the Old Testament law that approves defense against home invasion, Exodus 22, 2 and 3, that we referred to last week. Jesus said, How can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property Unless he binds the strong man first. Now evidently we're talking about a home invasion of a wealthy man who has prepared himself. Strong man may not only refer to his muscularity, but it might be because he was trained uh, to protect himself with a sword or whatever. Now in Luke chapter 8 it says, When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his, good, uh, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger man assails him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides the spoils. Jesus' matter-of-fact use of this analogy uh, means that both he and his audience accepted the Old Testament teaching of self-defense. And when Jesus felt a need to correct an abuse of the law, as he does in Matthew 5 with regard to a lot of things, he never said you should help others unless it requires the use of force. Now, Jesus taught what is called by authorities the sliding scale of force continuum, which means that the use of force is proportional depending upon the situation. When the large group of temple police 
and civilians came to arrest Jesus, our Lord said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as against a robber? In Mark 14, 48. Jesus was no threat to these men. Jesus never, ever, ever used a sword against anybody. There wasn't evidence sufficient to warrant arresting Jesus with force anyway. He implies clearly that force may be necessary to arrest a violent criminal, but that he did not qualify. He does not negate the right to use force, to arrest or stop a criminal, but he denies that they didn't have really a right to treat him this way. And so he puts the proper use of force in contrast with the improper use of it. You know, Jesus' careful use of words for taking of human life is very important. When Jesus talks about the illegal act of taking human life, and he refers to the Old Testament, he told the, uh, the, the scribe who wanted to know uh, what commandments he ought to obey, and Jesus said, among many, you shall not murder. In Mark 19, 18, no, pardon me, Matthew 19, 18, Mark 10 and verse 19, and Luke 18 and verse 20, all have the statement that you do no murder. Okay? Now, the Greeks also had a different word for kill, be it by accident or intentionally. The generic word, whether by murder or self-defense, is apokteno. Jesus never uses the generic word when condemning the taking of human life when it's murder. Just as the law of Moses and the law of the land make a distinction between murder and justifiable homicide, so does Jesus. Jesus never condemns justifiable homicide. Self-defense. He condemns murder. And that word only means murder. And the word is phanel. Now, let's go back to Luke 22, 35 through, uh, 35 through 38, where Jesus tells the disciples to go and purchase swords. Now, I've been reading objections to using this as justification for self-defense and I'm appalled at the ridiculous arguments that are made to remove this as support for us today to use uh, force if necessary. Jesus authorizes the disciples to carry a weapon for self-defense. What else would it be used for? And with tongue-in-cheek, Last week I said, I don't think Peter needed that sword to uh, remove the scales from fish while he's fishing. You know, I think that this is something entirely different. The word sword here is used specifically to use in battle or enforcing the law and obviously self-defense. So, he would teach them that evening the proper use of a weapon which is done by every instructor in California who teaches the applicant uh, to qualify him for concealed carry weapon license the proper use of a gun and when and how to use it and this is what happens Jesus went to the garden he was arrested and Peter pulled his sword one of the two that had it and swung it at the priest's uh, servant's uh, head and cut his ear off. Peter, uh, uh, Jesus, immediately said, put your sword back in its place. They who live by the sword shall perish by the sword. Jesus told Peter also that his attempt to prevent the rest was thwarting the plan of God. In John 18, 11, put the sword into its sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? 
In other words, I do not want you to defend me because this is the plan of God. Under the circumstances, Peter was acting illegally to defend Jesus against the arrest. Whatever you say about the justification of that warrant, they did have it. And therefore, a, a person who is being arrested, if they resisted arrest, they would be resisting the law. And second, they had that warrant, and so Peter was acting contrary to the law, and Jesus was not condemning self-defense, he was regulating it. The laws of our states present the boundaries of justification, justifiable use of force. And everyone who would defend themselves and others need to read those laws that are available on the internet and read them carefully because someday if you defend yourself and you did not know the regulation and the laws of justifiable, justifiable self-defense, you could land yourself in jail, if not prison, and then suffer a civil suit and lose everything you got. So, just as Jesus regulated self-defense, the law of the land regulates self-defense. And let me tell you, um, California doesn't always get it right, but I believe that they've gotten it right with regard to this. Uh, in Iowa, for example, you can get your concealed carry license simply by applying online and paying a fee, and then they do a background check, and that's all, and you get your license to carry a gun. They have no idea whether or not you know the difference between the barrel and the trigger. They have no idea if you can shoot. They have no idea if you have any concept of, of safety with regard to carrying a, a gun. And that to me, is a dangerous thing. But in California, they have great training requirements for anyone that would be authorized to carry a concealed weapon. And so Jesus makes it clear that self-defense must be done in an appropriate manner and according to the laws of the land. Now, let me share you a lesson that uh, is a, a, a lesson of event closer to home. We know that there are a lot of mass shootings in schools and churches and elsewhere all over the country. But shortly after noon on March 15, 2006, a homeless man named Lawrence Edward Woods walked into the Denny's restaurant there on Pismo Beach near 4th Street Overpass. Muttering and looking dazed, he began shooting. Valquez, 64-year-old, was shot within a few seconds and died in front of his wife and granddaughter, great-granddaughter. Hatley, 72, was killed while trying to wrestle Woods to the floor. Woods then turned the gun on himself and shot himself. Harold Hatley was honored by the Grover Beach City Council for his heroic actions. But what if someone was legally armed that day and alert to the potential dangers as a trained armed citizen would be, facing the door attentive to everyone who was in the restaurant or who entered the diner? At least one man or possibly two might have been saved that day. You know, the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And let me tell you, Harold Hatley showed his willingness to love his neighbors, and he lost his life for it. But I wish he could have had a gun instead of using his arms to try to disarm the armed madman. So Jesus obviously does not condemn self-defense. He used it, and also he promoted it in telling the disciples that in dangerous situations, you ought to be armed. And so I want to share one more lesson on this vital subject, although we said it would only be three. 
And that's the role of the church leaders as shepherds of the flock who must protect the flock from danger. And so I'm titling next Sunday's lesson, Defending the Flock, and hope you'll be there for that. We're going to close this lesson by offering them an invitation. If you have not been baptized,